welcome to uh, Science Cafe. Carlton has been hosting Science Cafes for the last 12 years. We started in 2008. The then Dean of Science thought it would be a good idea to allow Carlton researchers to get out and uh, talk to people in the community about their work. This summer, of course, we're running things a little differently because we've never had a summer science cafe before. But uh, the real difference, of course, is that we're all here together on Zoom. Uh, but it has offered us the opportunity to expand and reach a wider audience of people. So I hope we'll keep the best of reaching out virtually once we're back together and we can go back to getting together physically in Science Cafe. Because after all, when we get together physically at the Sunnyside branch of the Ottawa Public Library, we have coffee and cookies. So that makes everything uh, go well. So this uh, Science Cafe, our speaker is Dr. Kyle Bigar, and I realized I didn't ask him how to pronounce his last name. So we'll hope that that's the correct pronunciation. Uh, Kyle did his PhD at Carleton University and finished that up in 2013. He was an award-winning graduate student. In fact, he won the Governor General's Gold Medal for uh, graduate research. And then he went off to do a postdoctoral fellowship at the Schulich Mental and Dental School, where he studied uh, cancer and proteomics and established a research profile there. And then came back to Carleton in 2016, where he's a member of our Institute of Biochemistry. And he's also involved with the uh, Ottawa local company Nouveau Bio Pharmaceuticals, where he and his group hold over 45 patents for uh, pharmaceutical compounds. His main focus of uh, research has been for the past number of years, uh, the treatment of cancer and um, how genetics and genomics can be brought to bear on the study of cancer responses and cancer treatment. Uh, Kyle's also very involved at Carleton with the Carleton Therapy Dogs program and I thought I would share that with people uh, very briefly just if you're interested I'm going to share my screen and show you the little profile of some of the therapy dogs that uh, are at Carleton. I hope this is uh, coming through because when I hit share screen, oh, there we go. I was going to say when I hit share screen, I'm not seeing it. But uh, the Carlton Therapy Dogs program is an award-winning program and Carlton is by no means the only university to have a, a, a program where students can interact with dogs as a stress release. But it was one of the first to set it up and many other universities have used Carleton as a model and, and Kyle said profile of his uh, assist dog Roxy and again I hope you see this on your screen because I am not seeing my share screen I'm simply seeing it on my screen but uh, Roxy has been very involved with the uh, Science Student Success Center in helping students who were stressed or anxious or just away from home and missing their pets as well as their families. So Carlton's very proud of its uh, therapy dog program. But Roxy's going to be stepping back just a little bit from her role as a Carlton therapy dog because Roxy has a new role this year. She's a brand new sibling. Kyle is also the uh, brand new first time parent of a three month old child. So welcome Kyle. I will turn the share screen over to him and he will be able to tell you about his research at Carlton University in the Institute of Biochemistry. Great, thanks Pam. I'll just uh, share my screen here. Okay, um, so I assume everyone can see my, my screen. And I will tuck in before going mute that I certainly can, so that's okay. a good sign. Great. 
so this talk is titled Therapeutic Anti-Cancer Potential of a Novel KDM5C Inhibitor, which may be a mouthful. Um, so I'm stepping back a little bit, giving you a secondary title, uh, the development of novel peptide-based inhibitors uh, at Carleton University, right? So, so we've developed several new methods or pipelines to be able to create potential drugs that can be used in an anti-cancer way uh, here at Carleton, and I'll be showing you a little bit how we do that. And I'll be using our KDM5C drugs as, as our main example, essentially. And so what you're looking at here, um, I can, I'm just assuming you can see my, my cursor here, but what you're looking at is uh, what would be a peptide, which is essentially a small fragment of a protein uh, bound to, a, to another protein here on, on this picture here. So what we're doing is we're making these peptides uh, that interact with cancer targets or other proteins and evaluating them for anti-cancer uh, potential. And we, again, we do that in partnership uh, with a pharmaceutical company here called uh, Nuvo Bio. And so before we start, I'll show you uh, a snapshot of the landing page for my lab's website. And so I think it's a nice way to, con to kind of demonstrate uh, the research areas that my lab is involved with. Uh, so I'll break it down for you a little bit. So if we focus in on the research side of the web page, you'll see uh, four fundamental research areas. Uh, we focus on hypoxia, which is uh, the study of low oxygen environments, protein function, so how proteins work in the cell, uh, drug design, which we'll be talking about today, as well as bioinformatics and uh, computer engineering. So we develop software packages and use machine learning or artificial intelligence to be able to address some, some larger biological questions. And so if you focus on these four research areas, you see that they're all interacting with a larger research program here in the center, uh, which is something that we call lysine methylation. And that's this, this uh, cyclical image right here. And so what, what this represents is there's proteins and they can be chemically modified uh, through the addition of a small chemical group called methylation by a group of proteins called methyl transferases. We'll just denote them as KMT so they get added and equally they can be removed by another class of proteins called KDMs. This is important because these two classes of proteins, the proteins that add these chemical modifications and the proteins that remove them are two classes of cancer targets. And so, so they've, you know, in the last 10 years, uh, they've risen in, in interest. Uh, we, we know them as drivers of cancer now, drivers of drug resistance, but we really know nothing about them, uh, which, is, which is why that's a fundamental uh, paradigm of my lab uh, research area. And so what we do is we, we research the protein function of these enzymes, and by researching you know, what they're doing in the cell, uh, we can make drugs that target them. We also work on developing these, these uh, computational resources, and I'll be talking about a few of them today, uh, and they're all accessible on our, our lab website. Uh, we'll, be, we'll, we'll be talking about PISA today, so we use this program called PISA, uh, to be able to screen and develop these drugs. And that was actually, I'm talking about it because that was developed by a third year undergrad student uh, in my lab who's done remarkable work. Uh, but we also recently published last month in a journal called Cell Reports, um, a, a, a resource called Methylcyte, which uses machine learning to be able to look into the human cell and identify uh, these chemical modifications that occur to proteins, these methylation events that occur to proteins. And so that's, that's essentially what my lab uh, works on. And so we're a lab of, of about 12 strong right now, uh, and we've been established since late 2016. Uh, I like to show this slide as it kind of puts um, my research into focus, you know, especially when we're talking about drug design and, and uh, cancer therapies. Uh, this is, this is the, the pipeline of how these cancer therapies are developed. Really, it begins with basic research, 
Uh, and as we understand cancer and identify cancer targets, we, we begin developing therapeutics uh, from this basic research and, and that they enter preclinical translational research and eventually clinical trials and uh, interacting with patients. And, and, and I am not a clinician and I don't work with patients. And so I think it's very important to frame uh, the work that I'm going to be talking about today in, in this basic research, preclinical research uh, area of drug development. And as we develop uh, the, these inhibitors or these potential therapeutics, they begin to flirt with translational research. Uh, and just before you know, uh, the COVID pandemic hit, uh, we had started some of our drugs in animal model testing. But of course, that has been paused for the, for the time being. But most of the research that we, that we focus on is, is in the basic and preclinical research um, side of things. And so basic research is driven by fundamental questions. So I'll break that down for everyone. How do things work in the cell? Just a basic question. You know, how, how do these proteins, how do things work in the cell? What mechanisms promote cancer, right? So dysfunctions on how things regularly work. How do they promote cancer? Uh, how do cancer cells become resistant to chemotherapy, right? So how do these cells develop resistance to, to modern chemotherapy agents? Uh, and if we can understand how a cell functions, we can understand how its dysfunction contributes to disease. And so that's what we're doing. We're developing these inhibitors, these drugs, essentially to be able to study cell function with the added benefit that some, sometimes they can be used as, as therapeutics. Uh, so some of you, many of you, maybe all of you, <coughs> will remember the, the Human Genome Project uh, sequenced in 2001. It was certainly a big deal. It was a big deal in my life. I certainly remember it. Um, <clears throat> you know, it was hailed to, you know, vastly increase the pace of scientific discovery, uh, be the solution to drug target discovery, which means if we could identify the genes, right, in the human genome that are mutated, uh, we can identify drug targets, right? So if, a, if protein X is mutated in a cancer, well, we'll develop a drug against protein X. Um, that turned out to not be completely true. Uh, so, however, instead we gained a realization that disease progression is the result of a miscommunication or a dysfunction of proteins. And so the genome acts like a blueprint to build these proteins. And the proteins are the functional units of the cell. Uh, they actually go out and do a lot of the jobs in the cell. And the genome provides the blueprint to create these proteins. Uh, so dysfunction in protein function has dramatic effects on normal cell biology. So you know, what we did realize is if there's a mutation in the genome, that can or may result in a mutation in the protein and a dysfunction in that protein's normal job in the cell. So if we can study what that protein job is normally in the cell, uh, we can identify better cancer targets. So we'll take a step back here uh, what is a protein? So I'm talking about proteins and, and genomes, and I'm going to be talking about peptides and amino acids. And so it's, it's worthwhile kind of taking a step back and, and giving you a little primer of what we're going to be talking about. So what is a protein? So proteins are large biomolecules that consist of one or more long chains of something called amino acids. And so uh, if you look down here, you'll see a chain of these three letter uh, words. You know, uh, so these are the amino acids and essentially they're put together like a chain, like beads on a string or like Lego blocks. And so the genome provides the information on how to order these amino acids and put them together to create something uh, that would be a much larger protein. Okay, so we're going to be talking about amino acids here. Um, think of them like the building block or, or the Lego pieces that create a protein, and a protein goes out in the cell and does jobs. So the sequence of amino acids differ between proteins and is dictated by the genome, right? So the genome acts like a blueprint. And so the cell has proteins, uh, and these proteins have jobs to do in the cell. So here we're showing two proteins. Protein one does cell function one, and protein two does 
does a cell function too. And it would be great if the cell worked like that for each protein, 20,000 odd proteins in the human cell, different uh, uh, types of proteins. And so if, we, if each protein had a one job or one collection of related jobs, it would be much simpler to study uh, how proteins work in the cell. But that's not the case. What actually happens is protein one might have one job and protein two might have a, another job. But a lot of the times they come together and form an interaction and go off and do a completely different job. And so uh, cell function number three. And you know what could be said here is cell function number three could be an anti-cancer related job, uh, the prevention of, of uh, oncogenesis, right? And so if there's a mutation in either one of these two proteins that prevent this protein-protein interaction or, or this communication between proteins, you won't have cell function number three and, and something like that could cause um, cancer progression. So the take home message here, uh, so I'll have these take home messages throughout the talk uh, to summarize the slides. The take home message here is physical contacts between multiple proteins may be necessary to carry out a biological activity. I like to think of it a little bit like this. And so we're starting off with a rather simplistic image, two proteins coming together to do one job. In fact, it's a little bit more um, convoluted. I'm not gonna say messy. I would, I would love to stake the claim that this is a picture of my desk, but no, it's from, from Google, um, where all of these wires would, would represent interactions between proteins that occur in the cell. It's a little bit more like this, a little bit more organized. Um, what you're looking at here is this certainly look, looks uh, complex, but each white dot is a protein that is in the cell. Okay? Uh, um, and the gray lines between these proteins are, are interactions that can occur between them, right? So, uh, one white dot might interact with another white dot, and they'll have a line between them that demonstrates that there's an interaction there. It looks very complex until you realize that you start seeing hot spots in this, in this network or in this web. And what happens is proteins that really kind of do the same job tend to interact with each other. So they form hot spots in interactions. And so we can actually map protein function or, or cell, cellular jobs um, onto this network. And you can see clusters of interacting proteins tend to be related to the same job, right? So if we're studying how, how protein dysfunction occurs, we need to really look at the whole interaction network. And, and this seems very broad, but I promise it'll come back uh, later on. But there's a few take home points here. Uh, the human genome has enabled research to identify genetic mutations that frequently occur in a disease. These disease specific gene mutations can alter amino acid sequence. Remember the gene mutations act like a blueprint and those amino acid sequence changes can influence protein structure. Uh, changes in protein structure or mutations in the protein uh, can result in changing protein interactions that alter this, this interaction landscape, this network that I'm showing you behind uh, this picture, leading to it, its dysfunction and you know, pos a possible contribution to disease progression. As a result of this high interconnectivity between proteins in the cell, any dysfunction in a single protein can have widespread influence within the cell and drive disease progression. So it's a lot more complicated than one mutation in one protein drives disease. You have to take into account all of these interactions and this network um, that we're, we're looking at behind this white box. And so identifying uh, viable therapeutic targets of proteins for drug development is really still a challenge even though we, d we sequenced the human genome uh, you know, almost 19 years ago. So why did we end up on KDM5C? So this drug target's coming back now. Uh, this, this word KDM5C, this, this drug target that we're developing
drugs against. And really that kind of rose uh, to importance in 2016 when KDM5 was found to be critical to developing um, drug resistance. So for a cancer cell to overcome and to develop resistance to a particular drug, that resistance, that formation of resistance is critical, um, or KDM5 is critical to the development of that resistance. And so really kind of basing it off of this pro this paper here, um, we're able to see that, uh, I'll, I can show you some of the data here where these, these light gray lines um, you know, are essentially changes in, in cell health in, in the parental cells, so the normal cancer cell, and then the black is a subpopulation of cancer cells that are developing resistance to a drug. And you can see that if you uh, inhibit or you know, essentially treat KDM5C with the drug, so you inhibit the, the function of KDM5, uh, you get a, a large amount of death in the drug tolerant population. So the formation of drug tolerance is tied to the activity of KDM5. KDM5 relates back to this dynamic picture that I showed on my website where proteins or enzymes, they, proteins add this chemical modification to other proteins called methylation and another set of proteins called demethylases remove them, they demethylate uh, the substrate protein. And they're called KDMs, and that's where the name KDM5 comes from. Uh, so it's a demethylase enzyme, and it's the fifth one to be identified. So lysine methylation is dynamic, and if we had a particular function for KDM5, if we knew what KDM5 did in the cell, it would be a lot easier to study it uh, and to develop drugs against it. But unfortunately, we don't know what KDM5C does in the cell, and we really don't fully appreciate what lysine methylation does in the cell. And so here's all of the jobs uh, that lysine methylation is currently known to be a part of in the cell. And this is a, these are very broad descriptions of cellular jobs. So here you see cell cycle. So that's um, cells growing and dividing. Uh, regulation of apoptosis is cell death. So whether a cell decides to, to grow or that it's reached the end of its life and to, and to die, essentially. Transcription and translation, so transcription, um, you know, translation, making proteins, making the, uh, the transcripts that encode the proteins, repairing damaged DNA, these are all processes that are now known to be involved in methylation. And this is a very large list of processes that KDM5 could be involved with. And to make it to make it more complex, this is a growing list. Um, so it doubles every couple of years. So this is where my lab uh, enters in. So we need to, one, study what KDM5 is doing in the cell. And I won't be talking about that uh, in this talk, but one of the reasons why we make these inhibitors, we use them as molecular tools uh, to be able to study the function of this drug target in the cell. So not only are they potential therapeutics, but they also allow us to study the normal and disease-related biology of the drug target. And so we have this rather complex uh, pipeline of developing these drugs here at Carleton that we developed uh, when I first started. So some of this has been in collaboration with other research groups. Uh, some of it has been in collaboration with Nuvo Bio. Um, Nuvo Bio is a biopharmaceutical company here in Ottawa that's headed by um, uh, Michael Copeland, who used to run uh, Nortel and Corel here in Ottawa. Um, but, you know, we talked about this vast network of protein interactions a few slides ago. This is where it fits in, right? Right here. So we take all of this knowledge of how proteins interact with each other in the cell and use that knowledge to develop small pieces of proteins um, that interact with our drug target. And so I'll, I'll simplify this even more into just three stages uh, that we work on in the lab. And the project I'm gonna be talking about uh, has been headed by two students. So 
Dr. Amanda at Hickory, which is a postdoc student in my lab, and uh, Matt Folkstra, which is a PhD candidate. In his third year of study, and so you can see here we have three stages. So stage one, actually developing the inhibitors, and these are screening libraries, um, learning uh, what sequence of amino acids likes to interact with our target, characterizing these, these inhibitors. Um, do they bind to our target? Do they stop the activity of our target? And in this case, our target is this KDM5C protein. Stage three, can we get these drugs into the cell? Do they still work when they get into the cell? And how effective are we at treating cancer? So the take home message here is we developed a novel pipeline uh, for protein inhibitors to be used as potential cancer therapeutics. And as a, you know, seemingly relevant to, to today, uh, this pipeline has also been funded um, for use in developing antiviral peptides against SARS-CoV-2 proteins. And so my lab has been in operation uh, for the last several months, uh, developing these pipelines again, the, these peptides in this pipeline, again, uh, not for cancer targets, but now for, for SARS-CoV-2 targets. So this is stage one. This looks rather complex, and don't worry, I will break it down. Uh, but essentially, you're looking at three steps. So step one, which you could say is, is broad screening, broad fishing for, for our drugs. Uh, then we reduce the, the degeneracy, make it more specific and more specific again, and end up with a list of 20 peptides you know, that are nine amino acids in length that are candidate inhibitors. And so what we'll do is I'll zoom in here and show you what exactly we're doing. So again, peptides are these small pieces of proteins. They're made up of amino acids. I think of amino acids like the building blocks or the Legos that produce proteins. If it's a very small protein, it's called a peptide. And what we're doing is we're making peptides, so very small pieces of proteins that go into the cell bind to a specific target protein that we believe to be driving cancer and inhibit its function. Uh, but we need to design these small pieces of proteins, these peptides. And so what we do is we start very uh, degenerately, so very broad. Um, so what I did is I zoomed in on just these, these upper six dots, because all you're doing is you're looking at dots and, I, and you don't really know what I'm showing you here. So these dots represent uh, peptides. So these, this is a digital representation of an of a experiment that happened in my lab. And these circles have peptides printed on them. And this is, you know, this is the sequence of the peptides that are printed here. Uh, we, we cast a very wide net in, st in step one. And so what we do is we put one amino acid, so in this case it's a K, so it's called lysine, in one position and have everything else be have everything else be random. So these X's that follow it are a mix of all of these other 18 different um, amino acids. So you have something that's very degenerate except for that K in position one. If you move to the next circle, that's K in position two with everything else being random. The third circle is K in position number three and so on and so forth is that lysine or that K moves all the way through this peptide. If you move down to the next row, you have arginine, which is denoted with an R, again, moving all the way through this, this sequence. Then we take our, our cancer target, which is this KDM5C protein. We allow it to, to interact with all of these peptides and we see you know, which set of peptides does our drug target like to interact with. We produce a signal from that and then using computational tools we learn broad rules. Uh, so for example in this example here uh, KDM5C likes to interact with peptides that have that R in position number two or that K in position number one, right? So we can we can look at this this digital signal, uh, learn from how what type of peptides KDM5C wants to interact with and make successive experiments that, 
reduce this degeneracy till we get to final specific sequences. And so that's really the take home message here. Uh, it really starts with about 10 billion peptide sequences. So we start with about 10 billion uh, and then we whittle our way down to 20. And so this step one represents about 10 billion peptide sequences. Uh, we learn from that using uh, this software called PISA that was developed in my lab. Uh, we learn from this and reduce the degeneracy and reduce the degeneracy again until we hit the actual peptide sequences and we hit 20. So we denote them EP1 to EP20. This is experimental peptide 1 and experimental peptide 20. And that's great. We have a list of peptides now that, you know, at least in a, in a dish in my lab interact with KDM5. Uh, so now we move to step two, so biochemical characterization. Again, I will uh, simplify this slide just for the time being, and we'll focus on this, this top plot. And so what we learned so far was we came up with a list of 20 peptides, EP1 to EP20, that bind to our drug target, so KDM5C. They interact with it, but we don't know that it uh, changes its activity I could just interact with it and do nothing else. We're what we want are peptides that interact with it uh, and inhibit its normal function in the cell. So if you look at this plot, uh, this is here is a measure. It's a, it's a percent measure of our drug target activity where you have 100% activity all the way down to zero activity. And what we want all of these traces here, are all of these 20 peptides that I showed in that last slide, and what we want is a peptide that really decreases activity of our drug target really fast. And so this is the amount of, of drug here. So we want something that's really effective. And we found one of our peptides called experimental peptide 4, so EP4 in this red trace was very good. So that was certainly very promising. Uh, this is the, the structure and the sequence of that EP4 peptide here. So that's great. So we have a peptide that interacts with our drug target, that it inhibits the activity of our drug target, but how strong does it interact with our drug target? And so that's what these experiments look to do. Um, I won't go into the details of this experiment unless you're interested in it, then please ask me. Uh, but the take home message from this is this is a measure of how tightly does our drug interact with our drug target? And so what you're looking at here is this EP4 peptide interacts with its drug target, KDM5C, about 10,000 times stronger than a normal biological interaction that occurs in the cell. So certainly biologically relevant, certainly stronger than what normally occurs in the cell. The next step is, can we evolve this peptide? Can we evolve this, uh, this uh, inhibitor? Can we make it better? Can we make it smaller? Can we make it longer? Can we make mutations to the amino acid sequence to make it better or worse? Uh, so what you're looking at in this strip image here is darkness. This, the darker the circle uh, means more interaction with the drug target, KDM5C. And so in the very first circle here, we added some, we made it a little bit longer, and it retained the interaction. Then the second circle is our EP4 sequence again, so we expect interaction there. And then we cut it at, from both ends. We took the T away, we took one of the H's away, and lo and behold, all of the interaction was gone. So we were at the shortest uh, that we could possibly be while retaining interaction. And then what we did is we tried to mutate it. Uh, so what we're looking at here is our EP4 sequence. And then we take one of these, pep these amino acids and mutate them to these other amino acids to see if interaction is retained, decrease, or increase. And really what you can see is this T, if you mutate it to anything else, it's still, you know, it, it, the, the signal turns red, which means a lower interaction. So if you mutate this T, to anything other than T, uh, interaction decreases. 
Same with these three H's uh, on this end of the peptide. If you mutate them away from H, all interaction goes away. And so it looked like we were very well optimized uh, again. So the take home message here is we focused our study to one peptide that showed promise as an inhibitor of our cancer target. This sequence was found to associate very strongly with KDM5C, so 10,000 times stronger than a normal biological interaction. Two, be of optimal length. And three, not tolerate mutation, so to be fairly optimal. So all of this is great but you're left with, well, if I had a molecular airplane, it would be great to see where this, where this peptide actually interacts with my drug target, right? This KDM5C, where does it interact? Uh, KDM5C is a fairly big protein. Our EP4 peptide is very small. So where does it interact with our drug? And so what you're looking at here is in this image, this is the whole protein, uh, KDM5C. This, this is a ribbon structure here and we colored different functional domains in the protein. Uh, so you see blue, we, we're interacting with the blue piece of the KDM5C protein, and the blue piece is the functional part of KDM5C. So our, our EP4 peptide is interacting in a little pocket, and our drug target, uh, e, uh, KDM5C, that is responsible for its demethylation activity, which, which is great, and that makes sense. Um, here, this, this orange branch structure is our EP4 peptide, and you can see it nestled in, in the, what, what we would call the active domain. So the take home here is our EP4 inhibitor peptide binds to KDM5C in its functional domain, acting to block the normal biological activity, in this case, the removal of, this, of, of methylation, that chemical modification uh, of the protein. So this mechanism is being further explored in the laboratory of uh, Dr. Uh, Operman at Oxford University. So they're also very interested in demethylase inhibitors. And so they picked up on this project and they're collaborating now to, to further refine uh, how this interaction is occurring. So that's great. Um, we, you know, we went through stage one, developing these inhibitors, stage two, characterizing them, and now stage three, and really I'm, I'm shrinking three years work down into a single slide, um, is you know, cell function, and how does it compare to another commercial drug that also targets KDM5, right? So we're not the only drug um, that, that has been developed to, to target this, this, this KDM5 protein. So I'm going to show you how we how we compare and actually cellular activity of our drug. And so KDM5C normally, so this is the KDM5 protein, normally in the cell removes these chemical modifications from a protein called uh, H3. Um, so we denote it H3K4, and it removes these these methyl modifications. And that's the normal job. Um, so we can look at H3K4 methylation levels, so this marker here uh, as an indicator of KDM5C cellular activity, where we would want to see an increase in H3K4 methylation levels when KDM5C is inhibited because it can't remove it, all right? So we're looking for an increase in signal when KDM5 is inhibited. Uh, this is what we're showing here, so let's focus on panel A and just the top two bars. Uh, so the top bar here, what you're looking at, the, the darker uh, the band, the more uh, H3K4 methylation there is. On this axis here is we're increasing the amount of KDM5 inhibitor, and it's either our EP4 peptide here, or the commercial peptide called, or, well, it's not a peptide, it's a small, small chemical drug called CPI455. And so essentially what you want is you want this, this, uh, this band to become darker sooner or darker at a lower concentration of inhibitor. And so you can see with our drug, um, really we, we increase uh, levels of H3K4 methylation right away and much sooner than uh, the only other competing drug. And so we can, we can quantify this 
And you can see uh, this is a representation where higher is better uh, of our drug in, in blue versus the, um, the commercial comparable uh, CPI 455. So we're certainly doing well, both biochemically and in the cell, but let's relate this back to cancer. Um, <clears throat> so the inhibitor outperforms a commercially available inhibitor called CPI 455. And I underlined here um, where you can see we're actually working. And so we kind of zoom back out now and say, well, we developed this tool to be able to study KDM5 biology, and that's a whole separate aim, you know, a whole separate project in my lab. But it also has the potential to be an anti-cancer drug. Uh, so what we do is we screen this peptide, and we screen all of the peptides in our lab uh, against a panel of 60 different cancers, uh, 60 different cell lines that represent 60 different cancers. You can see all of the names here. They're not going to mean a whole lot to, to you, uh, but essentially what I did is I categorized them in, into tissue types, okay? Um, so nine different tissue types. And you know, these different cell lines represent subcancers uh, within, that, within that tissue. Here, what we're looking at is concentration of our drug, so increasing amounts of our peptide drug, and the growth of these cancer cells with different concentrations uh, that we've supplied them. So what we can see is there's a subset of cancers that were very effective in treating. Um, these are non-small cell lung cancers, uh, one cell line from a CNS cancer, and one cell line from renal cancer. Uh, but we decided to focus on uh, non-small cell lung cancer moving forward. <clears throat> so our peptide was tested on 60 different cancer cell lines. This is a very large experiment, uh, and it was found to be effective in vitro treatment for several types of kidney and lung cancers. Uh, collectively, our N this, this whole panel is called NCI60, so the National Cancer Institute 60 for 60 different cell lines. There's actually 59. Um, so these NCI60 results demonstrate the, poten the potential of peptide-derived inhibitors. So this, this whole story is um, really related to, you know, KDM5 drives drug resistance. And so, you know, we're effective on treating these cancers with our peptide by itself, but how do we do in co-treating a cancer with chemotherapy. And so what we did is we took one of our uh, lung cancer cell lines and we treated with a chemotherapeutic called cisplatin. Um, and then we co-treated with our peptide EP4. And so what you can see is we actually increased sensitivity to cisplatin uh, by 220% with co-treatment with our peptide inhibitor. And so what we're looking at now is evaluating uh, both our inhibitor by itself, but also uh, a combinatorial or a tandem treatment with chemotherapy. So the take home message here is focusing on cancer cell lines that have, ident have been identified by this NCI60 panel to be EP4 responsive. Our peptide to EP4 treatment was found to increase sensitivity of non-small cell lung cancer to cisplatin treatment. Um, so, you know, why did we focus on, on lung cancer, not renal? Um, it really has to do with, uh, um, we, we can, and if we had more time and resources, we certainly would, and we certainly have grants out there to look into renal cancer. Uh, but we decided to focus on non-small cell lung cancer uh, because KDM5, so patients with, with high KDM5C expression uh, are known to experience lower mean survival time. Uh, so we know it's established uh, that just KDM5C by itself, uh, its expression in patient cancers is diagnostic of survival time. And also um, relating back to one of these, the image that I showed you earlier, where we have uh, non-small cell lung cancer here, 
where KDM5C is already been demonstrated to decrease the population of cells that are drug tolerant. So KDM5C activity is important in the development of cancer cells that are drug tolerant. And all of this is great, but you know, how do target specific protein inhibitors lead to personalized medicine, right? So how do you translate a drug that is specific to KDM5C? I've never heard of KDM5C before. Why is it important and why should we be developing drugs against it? And so this leads to something called personalized medicine. This is just a single slide uh, that I want to show you guys to, to uh, put things in perspective. Again, I will simplify this here. And what you're looking at are uh, boxed, boxed here, where we have breast tissue and breast cancer cell lines here. And really what we're looking at is not important for the, for the point of, of this talk, but these are proteins here. These are pro proteins that are known to be important for breast cancer. So ERBB2 is called HER2. So this is an estrogen receptor. This is a, an insulin receptor or uh, response to growth factors. And this is something involved in DNA damage. But what you're looking at here is the level of activation of these proteins in these different types of cancers. And these could be patient cancers. These are cell lines for, for, for this purpose, but these could be patient um, samples. And you can see that even though these one, two, three, four, these last four cells here are all breast cancer, they have different profiles, right? So you can see different numbers here. They have different amounts of these expression of these proteins. And if you take drugs that are specific to these proteins, you can actually treat uh, not breast cancer in general, but the cancers that are showing a high expression of that drug target. So here, DDR1, we'll go here's the DDR1 uh, drug. All of the, you know, there's maybe 50% change in expression between uh, the different cell types. And we really don't see much uh, response in drug here. ERBB2, which is that estrogen receptor, we see really high levels in a cell line called BT474 and SKBR3. And the two cell lines that respond to a drug that targets ERBB2 is this BT473 and this SKBR3 here. So the green and the red trace, uh, these are the two cells that had the highest expression of this ERBB2. So if you pick a drug um, that is appropriate to the protein profile of the patient, you can uh, specifically treat that patient's cancer. And so here, um, you know, this, this, this insulin receptor was looked to be more active in MCF7 cells. And so the only cell line that responded here to an to a insulin receptor inhibitor was this blue trace, which again is the MCF7. So this is the birth of uh, of personalized medicine where they, they go into a patient's uh, cancer, sequence all of the proteins, not the genome, but actually look at the proteins and the protein uh, function and select drugs based off of that. And so this is the last slide here. So this is just um, everyone who's currently working in my lab. So there's two postdoc fellows, uh, four PhD students and, and a master's student right now, as, as well as a number of undergrad students. Uh, and um, we have several funding sources, so a couple of NSERC grants, MITAX, uh, funding from Nouveau Bio and Carleton University. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kyle. We will assume that everyone is uh, wildly applauding in their own uh, homes and studies. I've got a couple of questions in the Q&A already. And uh, if people have questions, you can type them in. First question that I have is, are, there, are the interactions between two proteins solely communication or are there other types of interactions? 
Yeah, so I mean, so that's a, that's a really good question. Um, so there's different types of interactions. So a lot of the times there can be interactions that are just like, let's see if I can zip, zip back here. So there's interactions that are just like, just like this where two proteins come together and go off and do a shared function together. But there's also interactions that are um, temporal, very uh, short lived, uh, where they might, an interaction might be a protein coming in and modifying another and then going away, right? So that would be, you know, an enzyme substrate interaction. Um, really it's it's very complex um but in long long answer short absolutely there's different types of interactions that's a great question uh so does peptide binding to kdm 5 c induce a structural change in enzyme i wish i knew the, the answer to that question it likely does um whether that structural change is functional has functional significance or not we don't know yet uh, we're doing the NMR studies right now with uh, Dr. Udo Operman at Oxford University, and that's exactly the question that he's looking to answer. Again, we had our first experiments in December, which means that our second round of experiments happened right uh, in COVID. So, you know, under normal circumstances, I could probably answer that question for you, uh, but unfortunately, we're still waiting uh, for that ex you know, for the answer to that. Um, we certainly know that it has functional changes, uh, you know, to the enzyme, it has functional consequences, and, and really that's all we need to move forward with, with, with the characterization. Uh, so how far is this kind of research from clinical application? Really um, coming from a basic uh, research laboratory like my own uh, that is developing towards clinical application longer uh, that it takes longer to get to a clinical application than something like a pharmaceutical company that's developing the drugs in-house. Uh, so our strategy really is to develop them up to the translational point um, and then, you know, give it out to the pharmaceutical companies to, for further development. Um, so we're about a year away from, from our Xenograph models and uh, it really, you know, when you're in the hands of a basic researcher, you want to understand everything there is to know about this about this peptide. Uh, so we're really looking at not only can you treat xenografts, but uh, what happens when you put this peptide as a as a spray, right? We're we're looking to treat lung cancer. Uh, so we have grants out now to to actually um, aerosolize this peptide, and and you know you could think about it as taking this drug in like a puffer. Um, for direct delivery of the peptide to the cancer. And so when you start adding in research questions like that, it takes longer and longer to, to get to the clinical application because uh, you're really just one lab doing all of this. And so as, as you learn more about an inhibitor and it gets more promise, more people get into the team and it goes a lot faster. Uh, so we're hoping to have our animal work done uh, within the next year to year and a half, depending on how, how quickly we can we can resume that research. Uh, and then at that point, we're looking to team up uh, with clinicians. And so certainly it takes any number of years. It, if you look at this slide here, um, you know, really this represents, you know, all of the potential drugs that get produced and how many would, you know, uh, get lost along the way to, to patient benefit and clinical trials. And so, you know, there's winners and loser, losers the whole way. So, so far we're on a winner, uh, but we want to be careful. Will your best peptide inhibitor for KDM5C enter human testing phase? Uh, that's the plan. Uh, there's certainly a lot of phases uh, to go through before we get there. Um, and the next stage that we're entering is, is you know, treating mice uh, that have lung cancer. And so we'll be looking at tolerability of our peptide, um, how healthy are the mice, uh, do they tolerate our peptide, looking at modes of delivery of the peptide. Um, you know, for example, if you just put the peptide 
in the bloodstream, it's not going to last very long. Uh, there's, there's other proteins in there that will break it up. Uh, you know, so it might last for 15 minutes, right? And so we need to, you know, to look at how tolerable is it? Is there any toxicity when it gets into a, you know, a, a, a mammal? And again, what's the best way to deliver that? And so we're thinking direct delivery um, through an aerosol uh, to lung cancers. <clears throat> so there are already tests, there are already some tests like Oncotype DX. Uh, is this line of research similar? Um, so that might be something that we can discuss um, after. So I'm assuming I'm not super familiar with Oncotype DX. I'm assuming it's a something like a, like a service. Uh, so we're teaming up with uh, the National Cancer Institute, which is in the states, and um, developing our inhibitors and testing them through the states uh, through that National Cancer Institute. Um, does the commercial inhibitor and your peptide bind to the same enzyme site? Yes. Uh, same residues? No. So, um, broad, broadly speaking, um, similar functional domain, uh, different residues. Uh, Dr. Udo, Udo Opperman is uh, one of the researchers that developed the CPI-455 inhibitor. And so he's very interested in comparing and contrasting how these two drugs work. And so that's part of that, um, that study as well. If KDM5C is involved in so many normal processes, are there any known dangers or side effects associated with inhibiting it? Yes, absolutely. Um, we have, we know of, so for example, in mice, uh, mice that have lost KDM5C show aggressiveness. Um, you know, in the in the brain. So, so that's something that we have to. We can only really test when when we're actually developing um, and 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 giving administering this this drug to to mice. Um, that's by giving a targeted delivery as well. We're trying to avoid uh, off targets, and so that's again why we're looking at the the aerosol spray, a direct delivery to the site of cancer rather than a peptide that's on, you know, randomly navigating the, the body of a mouse. Um, we have also developed algorithms in the lab to be able to predict what uh, our peptides interact with in the cell. So we know that, you know, so, so your question really is, uh, does KDM5C, it has so many different jobs, um, maybe some of them are not cancer related and critical to cell health. The other question here is, what if your peptide binds to multiple different proteins um, and is not specific to KDM5C? And so we've developed algorithms in the lab to be able to predict, right, as well as develop these inhibitors, but also predict off-target effects. So what does our EP4 peptide bind to? Is it only KDM5C? Does it, does it inhibit the function of related proteins as well? So we test for that. Uh, and that's one of the the magical things about our EP4 peptide is if we test related proteins to KDM5C, so other family members, so very related proteins, we don't see nearly the same uh, inhibition. So we have a question from uh, Remy. So when looking at peptide drugs or rather drug candidates, um, how do you combat the abundance of proteases and cancer cells and the formation of plaques in the body from peptides? So I think, um, you know, that's, that's a question that's really getting into that aerosolization, so avoiding, right? So the, Remy's really kind of pinpointing exact, you know, pitfalls to something like a peptide-based drug. So not only is it difficult to get into a cell, uh, but it's difficult to navigate um, these, these enzymes that are called proteases that can chop up your peptide once it's in the bloodstream. So that's why we're looking at direct delivery. Um, how is the intellectual property managed? Are you doing uh, public science? Or is this, uh, so these are, these are patented um, drugs. So um, I'm able to share with you the sequences of these today because uh, they, they, are, they do have patent applications. 
they they don't go through me. Um, so that's that's part of the partnership with with Nuvo Bio, right? So they they fund a large part of uh, of our research activity, and and then they they take care of the intellectual property and, and the patenting and everything. Um, <clears throat> So how specific, which is, which is actually to further that point, which is great because we wouldn't be able to do this research um, without partners, commercial partners, industry partners. Uh, so how specific is the binding uh, for KDM5C? Are there other chances it binds to other enzymes? And so that's, that's a question that I think I answered maybe two or three minutes ago, is we are absolutely concerned about that. And so we test for binding and activity with related proteins. And so uh, KDM5C is a, is a member of, of other KDM5 enzymes, A, B, C, and D. And so they're all very structurally similar, yet different from each other. And so we test our peptide against all of these, these related proteins uh, and test for specificity. And so we're highly specific for KDM5C which is one of the strengths of peptide-based drugs over something like a small chemical. Um, peptide-based drugs, you can have exquisite specificity. And we can also, in silico, predict uh, the specificity based off of prior knowledge of protein interactions using machine learning. And so we, we published some papers on that as well. So how is the development of antiviral peptides against SARS-CoV-2 going? Uh, they are going. Um, <clears throat> the, of course, uh, the pandemic has produced uh, novel challenges that have to be overcome. And there's, they are as simple as shipping, uh, getting things shipped to the, to, uh, into Canada, to the university. Um, it's certainly going well. Um, so we, we created our first round of peptides and we're testing for now um, peptides that, that can disrupt. We focused to this, the, the spike ACE2 interaction. So we're, you know, one of many, many, many labs uh, creating um, drugs to inhibit that interaction. We can inhibit that interaction in the lab. Um, but what we're really doing is also demonstrating um, the ability of this pipeline to produce not only anti-cancer peptides, but also antiviral and disrupt protein-protein interactions. So, um, great. I think that's it. Uh, so, I'll kind of end with this. If you guys have any other questions, um, feel free to reach out and to email me. Um, you, I can be contacted on uh, through my website um, or through email at kyle underscore bigger at uh, carlton.ca. Thanks. Thanks very much, Kyle, um, for that great talk. Um, I just want to remind uh, attendees um, that we will be having another Science Cafe on uh, August 19th at 1.30 with Erling Rudd, who will be talking about vaccines against COVID-19. So where are we so far? So please join us for that. Thanks again, Kyle, and thank you everyone for attending. Take care. Bye-bye.